Welcome back everyone. This is video two for chapter three lecture on energy and we're going to talk about energy transformations. If we look at a situation where we have a car sitting up at the top of the hill and where the potential energy would be quite high and kinetic energy low, as that car begins to roll down the hill, what happens is a transformation. The transformation from potential into kinetic energy so that at the bottom of the hill the kinetic energy would be the highest and potential the lowest. As it goes back up the hill we're going to decrease kinetic energy and increase our potential energy so we end up back at the situation to begin with. One note is whatever the, the total amount of energy is, the total amount added together of kinetic and potential energy, it stays the same no matter where you are in the hill. It's just changing between kinetic and potential. Let's look at another example. A planet in orbit around the sun would have kinetic energy highest when it's near the sun, potential the lowest, and furthest away from the sun, the potential would be high, kinetic would be lower. And the overall kinetic and potential of the planet is the same no matter where you are in the orbit. A pendulum would be another good example. There are other forms of energy besides or kinetic and potential, such as chemical energy. Heat is energy, although it was not always thought to be. Electric energy and radiant energy. The law of the conservation of energy states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be changed from one form to another. No deviations in the law of the conservation of energy have ever been found. So kinetic, potential, chemical, energy, heat, radiant energy can all be changed between one another. Let's take a look at what heat is, and we have a whole chapter on heat, uh, a couple chapters uh, in the future. Heat is simply uh, created in a body of matter, and it is due to the kinetic energy of the random motions of molecules, atoms and molecules. Less than two centuries ago, heat was thought of as a substance called caloric, and they believed that by absorbing caloric, an object would become warmer. It was thought to be weightless, invisible, odorless, tasteless. Count Rumford, also known as Benjamin Thompson, regarded heat as energy and not as a substance. He worked with cannons and he saw how much heat was generated from the friction. It was James Prescott Joule that actually performed the experiment to prove that heat was in fact energy and not some type of a substance. Our unit for heat, which is energy, we will stay with the joule. Joule performed uh, chemical and electrical experiments that agreed with mechanical ones and he announced the law of the conservation of energy in 1849. Here's this experiment demonstrating that heat is a form of energy. Here we have a beaker of water, a thermometer measuring the temperature, a paddle wheel, and a pulley system. As this weight pulls down, shown in the second picture here, the paddle wheel spins and you get a rise in temperature. So this was his demonstration to prove that heat was energy and not a substance. Let's talk about momentum. 
momenta, which is the plural for momentum, can give us insight into the behavior of moving objects, and in particular things that are hitting each other and exploding. Two types of momentum, linear and angular. They are vector quantities. So if you think about a moving object and Newton's first law of motion, uh, something that can, tends to continue to move at a constant speed, or what we call uniform motion along a straight path. So that moving object, a measure of that object's tendency to move at a constant speed along a straight path, we're going to call linear momentum, or we'll just call it momentum. Straightforward calculation, you take the mass of the object and multiply it by the velocity. So our units for mass are kilogram, velocity, meter per second. So our units for momentum will be kilograms, meter per second. It's a direct proportional relationship between momentum and mass and momentum and vector and but velocity, I'm sorry. If you double the mass, you're going to double the momentum. Likewise, if you double velocity, you will double momentum. Momentum is another, another conservation law. Momentum between interacting or a set of objects is always conserved. This image here is just showing high momentum versus low momentum for a baseball. So the baseball in this picture, the mass of the ball would be the same, obviously. Here it's going faster, higher velocity than this. So the momentum here would be greater because the velocity is greater. If you look at an iron shot, which is much more massive than a baseball, and hold the velocities constant, then the one with the greater mass, which is the iron shot, will have the higher momentum. So just looking at the direct proportional relationships between mass and velocity and momentum. I mentioned that momentum considerations are useful uh, for things that are exploding or colliding. And so once again, there is the law of the conservation of momentum. Let's take a look at conservation of momentum. Here we have interacting objects. Here we have a person that has a certain mass, we'll call M1, running at a certain velocity, V1, and we have a stationary sled with a mass of M2. If we wanted to calculate the momentum, we would simply calculate the person's mass times the velocity, M times V. This is not interacting yet, so we don't have to consider it. Now, as the girl jumps onto the sled, we've, now we have the mass of the sled that's going to be incorporated along with the person's mass. So we have M1 plus M2. And we multiply it by the velocity. In order to have M1, V1 remain equal to M1 plus M2 times V2, what we have to do is decrease the velocity because we've increased the mass. So if the mass goes up here, we'll have to lower the velocity in order to keep momentum equal in both situations. And in fact, we do here. Some things are not going in a straight line. They're going in a curved path. So we have angular momentum. It's the rotational quantity corresponding to linear momentum. And it is always conserved as well. We aren't going to be concerned about the formula for angular momentum, but we can state that Mass and velocity are important in determining angular momentum. And the complicating factor is the distribution of mass. How is the mass arranged in the body? The angular momentum here on the left of the skater and on the right are the same. It's conserved. Here with a skater's leg out, her mass is distributed along this line. She spins slower 
her mass would stay the same, her spin is slower, her distribution is different. When she pulls her leg in and spins, she's going to be spinning much faster, so her velocity is greater. Of course, her mass is the same, but look at her distribution is now right along her body rather than out when her leg was extended. What we can say is that angular momentum is equal in both cases. It is conserved. A spinning top exhibits angular momentum. Here is a summary of the terms work, power, kinetic energy, potential energy, rest. Oh, we haven't talked about rest energy. That will be my next video. But we have linear and angular momentum. This is a very valuable little table. It tells you what the units are, the symbol, uh, the meaning, and the formula. So you may want to keep this handy when completing your quiz.